right here um, is courtesy of Maria Vida, and I believe you got it from Dr. Hammer. Um, and this is just a way to sneak in aspects of how students can use different things to benefit their lives. And so these are called therapeutic lifestyle changes. And these are small changes that someone can make in their life to help benefit their mental health. And in this particular activity, students are taking a look at quick little snippets of research and they are reflecting on if this particular study is an experiment or if it's a correlation. And then they would also go on to graphically demonstrate how that study would be represented. So if it is an experiment, they're gonna draw a bar graph. If it's a correlation, they're gonna give kind of an example as to what it would look like because it is a positive correlation or a negative correlation. Um, and you can have students work on however many of these you want based on the time that you have. Um, I have my students do like three consecutive ones because with how I have it organized, I know they're going to hit at least one experiment and one correlation. And that also makes it so they don't know, you know, it, okay, well, these first two, I mean, they could have that. The first two were an experiment. Obviously, the third one is going to be a correlation, but I try to mix it up enough that they're not necessarily sure what it's going to be. Um, I also do it in that order because, oh, I think I have this switched on the one that I made a copy of. Um, I try to make it so that they're not going to interact with the same three ideas, so it's all mixed up enough. Um, so sleep, exercise, spending time out in nature, um, volunteering, spiritual involvement, nutrition and diet. So just different things that they can do in their outside everyday life. And you're just bringing that in every so often so that they are consistently made aware of those things and they see the benefit of adjusting their life within those aspects. Um, also an extension here. So there's a short PBS documentary. I think it's only about eight minutes long. So if they find this to be helpful, um, it goes a little bit more in depth with that one there. Um, and I think with what Maria has, I got to scroll down here. Um, it's not just about graphically demonstrating it. It's also writing a headline that would convey the results of that study. Um, so you're making sure that you can have causal language if an experiment and you're making sure that it's not, it's only relationship if it is a correlation that's there. All right. Steven, do you think I have enough time for me to talk about the Caitlin Ohashi one? Just because it is super relevant right now, I can do it probably pretty quick. Sure, no, I think so if you want, go ahead. Okay. So partly because we are dealing with the Olympics right now, I know Caitlin Ohashi is not currently on the team, um, but she is someone who demonstrates positivity in what she does. Um, and we, when we look at perspectives, we tend to kind of focus on um, people who are having negative things happen in their life. Like if you remember the outrageous celebrity activity, we are focusing on the negative aspects of human beings. This would take it in a different direction. So we're looking at the positive aspects of a human being. Um, and so this was done by Steve Jones and he has the students take a look at a clip. And I think he's got some snippets from some interviews that she's done. Um, and the students can tie these things back to different perspectives based on the key terms that they're pulling out. So this is after the information has been introduced to students. So they are familiar with some of the key terms to go along with the perspectives. So this would not be used as an introductory lesson. Um, but it would give them an example of someone who is positive within our culture and our society. And it is also highlighting some diversity here. Okay, what do we have next? Yep, got it. I have too many tabs open. That's all right. I was just, I didn't want to cut you off. I think I'm- No, you're fine. I'm up next. Um, hey, I just wanted to take a quick second to, to divert a little bit, just a, a little quick preview. You probably notice what we're doing now is, is pretty similar to um, what we were doing this morning. And we are working from, um, from the same, uh, same document that we were showing a lot before which we'll share with you once we've got it all cleaned up and ready to go. Um, what we have this afternoon is gonna be a little different from this. Um, Melissa and I will both be doing a separate uh, kind of presentation within that learning um, 
psychology of learning framework, but um, still looking at positive psychology. Uh, you know, one other thing I just want to share real quick too. I think um, what Melissa just shared, somebody mentioned in the comments how they liked that, um, that, you know, we should be, it shares the science behind that. I find that students really respond to that a lot. I think that they um, don't always understand the why. <clears throat> and when they do, it makes a difference. I had one student this year who gave a response about, um, about cell phone usage. They had just read an article about multitasking and, and it really took me aback. The student articulated really well. I always thought that when teachers had problems with cell phones, it was all about respect. Um, and it never really made the connection that, um, that the behaviors that, that we're asking them to engage in sometimes really are for, um, for their own well-being, for personal well-being. But back to positive psychology in, um, in our curriculum, um, we don't have anything here other than kind of explore on your own with um, biological bases and learning. Um, but in cognitive psych, two things I'd like to share with you. One of them, uh, this is an activity that I got from one of the um, textbook resource uh, suggestions and I adapted a little bit, but uh, locus of control and test debriefing. So at some point, sorry, I've got to share a different screen. Um, at some point uh, during the year after students have, um, have just got a test returned to them, um, I'll give each student an individual handout and they take this individual handout and I'll show you what that looks like real quick. It's really just a, a rating scale. What effect do the following factors have on your test performance? Um, Sometimes I have to talk students through this a little bit because, you know, some of you did really well, some of you did really poorly, some of you did average. The question here is asking which of these factors played the biggest role in your performance, whatever the performance was, not what made it good, what made it bad, but which, which factors were, were the most significant. So uh, you can see how difficult and easy the test was, academic ability, effort, luck. Um, I think most of you probably could quickly recognize um, some of these as reflective of a more internal locus of control, others as more reflective of um, external, internal locus of control. Um, the fifth question really isn't about locus of control. It's um, a little more related to self-serving bias um, sort of things. Was this test a good measure of what you've learned? Now, I've provided some general directions here for how to use this, but I um, take all of the individual handouts and uh, you can see they're asked to put their score on the test and it's anonymous. So after students hand in the, um, the papers to me, I just arrange them from top to uh, highest to lowest scores. So I've got them all arranged in a stack of highest to lowest scores and I count for the middle and just pull out, you know, pull out a median. So, I split the two groups in half based on high and low from the median. Uh, and this isn't very scientific. I kind of talk through the students with this as we're going. Like this looks like it's uh, you know, a pretty precise thing, but it's, it's not. This is really um, about demo and understanding as much as uh, good science, you know, good sound data. Um, but I split the class in half and I give one half of the class all of the high papers the other group, all of the low papers, and I asked them to average the responses. Um, so of course, this half of the class, group A, they're only gonna have information to fill in for the group A. They would have to uh, rely on the other half of the class to give them the information for group B. Um, and sometimes the size of the class, it, it takes a little logistical thinking to figure out how am I going to give a stack of papers to 15 to 25 students and, and have them calculate averages from that. Um, but the other thing I think is kind of important about this too is while I'm asking them to calculate averages, also acknowledging that um, taking average responses from data collected like this isn't necessarily a very sound um, uh, or accurate way to do things either. Um, but we're a little more interested in the efficiency and in, in getting through this rather than um, you know, proving anything important. Um, 
So when, when you know, for example, group A, when they finish, they're going to have all their numbers here. And then when group B finishes, they'll get the answers from group B and fill theirs in. And um, there's just a set of questions for them to answer based on the data. Uh, which factors was group A higher in? Which factors was group B? Um, I'll just leave that for a few seconds so you can read over those questions. And this will be on the document that's uh, that's shared with you as well. I just put a sample in of some results that that I got from a class once. Um, so group A represents um, students that were below the median. Group B represents those that were above the median. This would be the data collected. And um, from that, you know, it doesn't always turn out this way, but um, Group B placed less emphasis on the role of test difficulty and luck than Group A. Group A placed less, less emphasis on studying and academic ability. Um, and then I don't have answers for these, but I, I think it's kind of obvious here how this illustrates internal versus external locus of control. Where are you, um, where are you putting the, I don't know, blame isn't the best word, but um, is it the more external factors like luck and how difficult the test was, or uh, do you think more about what you did as far as the, the study, the preparation, um, or you know, natural academic ability perhaps even? Um, of course, with self-serving bias, the one that's always usually consistent, these, these numbers that you get in response to this are not really guaranteed to show anything that you think you're gonna show. The, the internal locus of control isn't always higher and vice versa, um, but this one's usually pretty solid. Um, the higher scores almost always feel like it's, it's a good measurement of what they've learned, while the, uh, the lower scores, not so much. Um, so the second thing related to that, and um, let's see, Melissa, sorry, I kind of added this one in um, today, a little more recently, but um, applying explanatory styles. Um, and another exercise that I've used before, again, I, I drew some of this from, um, the resources from, from a text, one of the suggested ideas, but um, just made up this story. Uh, you showed up to class today, you found out you had a test. Uh, just trying to get students to kind of role play and put themselves in that place. Pretend that this is you. Uh, what's your likely response? When that happens to you, what is your most likely response or two um, that you would use to explain how this happened, how you, um, how you didn't know that there was a test? And after they've had a, a minute or two to write down what their perceived response is, I have them look at these questions. Uh, did they write a response that looks a little bit more at um, uh, about other people or circumstances, or is it more internal? Uh, again, back to the internal, external locus of control. Um, I also have them think about you know, the stability. Is this a, a permanent thing or, or just sort of a temporary? Is it more global or is it more specific? Um, and well, I kind of got ahead of myself there. Um, number three would be more like the global specific. Um, and then just an, an explanation of those terms. And finally, a, a chart that just gives some examples of how each of these work. Um, so both of those are activities that kind of just relate to locus of control, explanatory styles, how they can impact our outlook on life and, um, and by impacting the way that we look at life um, as, as to another degree, you know, they impact the outcomes, our, our behaviors and um, performance. So moving from cognitive psych into um, motivation, emotion, personality, we've got a few uh, exercises there. I want to share this one with you guys. First of all, okay, um, I have my, my class make hand turkeys, and I know a lot of people are familiar with, um, with this article, uh, Is Your Lesson a Grecian Urn? Uh, we, can, we can reference that at some point um, if you've never read that. Basically, it's an article about, is this really a good lesson, or is it just a lot of fluff? Um, this lesson that I'm about to show you looks like a Grecian urn, but I don't think it is. Let me find it. Uh, I'm lucky because every year, um, 
when we start learning about motivation, emotion, and personality, it just happens to be really close to our Thanksgiving break. And this is usually a lesson that I'm able to do um, in the days that are leading up to our Thanksgiving break. And uh, in the midst of emotion, we take a, um, a little time at the beginning of class to talk about factors that affect happiness and well being. Um, I, after we go through that lesson, I just kind of end with this list of suggestions. This is a list of suggestions that uh, is taken right out of uh, most, probably most of the editions of, um, of the Myers textbook. I know that I got this one from um, ours and it's, it's an older edition. We just kind of um, you know, talk through these, open discussion, uh, but then I really highlight uh, gratitude as, as the one that we are going to focus on. Um, and then we go into the exercise. So before I get to the exercise, um, this one's something that's also linked, but I usually show this video, um, Experiment in Gratitude, the Science of Happiness. Uh, these people just identify somebody that's been meaningful to them in their life and um, take the time to, to get in touch with them, call them up, tell them that they appreciate them, tell them that they're thankful. Kind of a tearjerker, uh, you know, a feel good sort of thing. Um, and after that, here are the directions. I just have students to think about things they're grateful for, you know, come up with a list of five things. Um, and I have a lot of supplies for them to work with. Um, I just ask that they work quietly. Like I really, um, without being controlling or mean about it, it this, it's meant to be a quiet, reflective to yourself activity. Sometimes I'll use a little music. Uh, or something to focus them. Um, I, I just encourage them to just kind of lose themselves in the task. They always say things like, oh my gosh, I used to hate nap time so much in elementary school. I wish we could have it now. So it's kind of a thing like that. Like, look, I'm asking you guys to make hand turkey. So I know this does not seem like the most age appropriate task, but just, just relax and enjoy yourself. And um, the only requirement that I have for them is um, that they have an actual cutout turkey with five fingers um, that reflects the five things that they listed that they were grateful for. Um, some people are very literal, and even if there's no creativity, they at least have you know five words written on a hand. Other people go more abstract, and you know I encourage that. And you can see just some of the other um, others that I've gotten there um, to to make it a little bit more. Um, connected to the content, make it a little bit more, um, not rigor it's not rigorous, I won't say rigorous, but um, I do put a, uh, a large, I use some uh, you know, math, blue masking tape and just put a big tri triangle on the, on the wall um, with some markers along the, you know, running along that to indicate different levels. And just have them put the turkey on the wall, post it on the wall at a level at which they believe, according to Maslow's hierarchy, um, you know, where they feel like it best fits. Is this, uh, the things you're thankful for, things that tend to reflect more of your, your basic um, physiological needs, or are you really looking much, uh, much higher than that on the pyramid with what you were thinking about of being thankful for um, with, uh, we have friends, family, things like that. Um, and again, um, I do try to um, you know, be clear when I'm doing this about the purpose. This is a, um, a little bit about learning, but a lot bit about the experience, de-stressing, taking a break, um, and just relaxing a little bit, right? So um, I do think though, that if you really are just not gonna have your kids make hand turkeys and, and I don't have time to do that sort of thing, um, I think Melissa is gonna share a few more activities um, that can kind of be fun, maybe not fun, decalming, not decalming, but calming and de-stressful um, that have a little bit more rigor. Okay, I do want to highlight, um, I have a clip on the calendar, or not the calendar, that's what I use in my classroom, um, on the doc that we're going to share with you. Um, it's a one minute TikTok, and it is of Tabitha Brown. If you do not know who she is, you need to. She is absolutely wonderful. 
Um, and I use that as an example of unconditional positive regard. And it's just a solid minute of like speaking to the person who's viewing it saying, you are loved, you are worthy. I don't care what's going on in your life. You are still of value. Um, and I just like to show that because my students need to hear that every so often. Um, so I've got that on there. Your students likely should know who this is. Um, so that'll be kind of a nice little thing for them to feel like they're connected. And maybe you are aware of like their TikTok world if you're not a part of it. All right. So this is a presentation that Heather Chambers and I did for NCSS. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing because um, I think we've only got about 20 minutes, if I remember correctly. Um, but this is something that I do with my AP students because it's super important for them to learn about um, stress management techniques. But I also don't always feel like I can sacrifice class time. I want to make sure that we are doing right by the AP curriculum. And if I can mesh them both together, why not? So I created a lab in which students get to interact with three different things. I know it says four on here. I've, I've reduced it so there's um, maybe less for them to do, but it also makes it a little less stressful. Um, they have the very first thing that they are to do is a goose chase activity. If you're not sure what that is, it is a digital scavenger hunt. And for that particular thing, I introduced that as a way for them to interact with things that would be inappropriate for them to do in a classroom, um, like kissing each other, getting involved in religion, you know, um, naps, because I wouldn't use my class time for that. I don't feel like that's a good use of time, um, but things that they can still be introduced to. And so what they do is they go around the school building and they have to go find a certain location. Um, they have to go find a copy of a religious text in the library. They have to do a yoga pose in the like front entrance of the school building. Um, and then what they do is depending on that task, they take a picture of it or a video, or they just check in at that particular location. Part of the other reason why I have them do this is because I want to actually purposely add in confounding variables because this gets their heart rate up. And part of this entire lab is that they are rating their stress level before and after activities and um, their heart level for sure. I'm lucky enough that I have access to blood pressure cuffs as well. Um, they're only doing the blood pressure cuffs at the beginning of the lab and at the end of the lab, whereas stress level and heart rate are after every single activity. Um, they have a doc that they're working from, and I have the doc purposely set up so that it's second page first for them because that's where the links are for different things. So after they do that goose chase activity and they come back in and they rate their stress level and take their heart rate, um, then they can pick two other activities to do during the rest of the class period. And I ask that they spend about 10 minutes on each. So it's enough time that they can get engaged in it, um, but enough time that they can get exposure to other things. So they are aware of this prior to class so that they can make plans for what they want to do, um, especially if they want to bring a book, they're in the middle of something they really get lost in, they can bring that in. Um, but these are all linked in here if there is a digital activity to go with it. Um, in addition, Every single research study that these activities are based on are also linked on here because I want them to see that we're doing things because they are research-based as to how they're able to benefit their life. Um, they have not only keeping track of their heart rate and the activity and stress level and all that sort of thing, um, they're also reflecting on um, scientific foundations and research methods. Because when we do this activity, it is in the motivation, emotion, and personality unit, which is in our second semester. Um, but with this course being so heavy within research methods, you want to bring it back in as often as you can. And so they are. They're also reflecting on aspects of our current unit of motivation and emotion. Um, so whether they experienced flow, like getting lost in one of those activities, um, what the physiological responses with stress have to do with. Um, I do ask that they identify confounding variables. Like I said, um, for some of them, they'll realize the goose chase was a confounding variable. For others, they'll say, you know, 10 minutes wasn't long enough for me to get involved in an activity, uh, trying to choose what de-stressing activity actually stressed me out. So that's a confounding variable. 
Um, but then I just have them reflect on the activities themselves. What do you think you're going to incorporate in your life after this? Um, I know there was something else I wanted to point out. Now I can't remember what it was. I'll, I'll come to it. Um, so they have different activities. They can journal their thoughts. I've got some um, of these gratitude journals sitting on one of the back desks. They can do some box breathing. And if they want to listen to some sort of relaxing sound as they do it, so that's actually linked to two different um, research back techniques. Um, they can do yoga. I do have a YouTube video um, that seems to be a little more culturally responsive in that. So we're not just highlighting people who have capitalized on this. And I do also have links when it comes to meditation and yoga for students to be able to get some education on um, appreciating the cultural or religious aspects behind these things instead of just using them for our own benefit and not giving respect to those who created it. Um, I have a digital like coloring website if they want, but also some coloring pages. And again, they can listen to relaxing music or sounds while they do that. Ah, now I remember what I was gonna say. All right, I have a lot of anxious students as I'm sure a lot of you do as well. Um, and I let them take one of those 10 minute sessions if they want and they can work on something school related, scholarship applications, that sort of thing, partly because otherwise I couldn't get them to buy in to actually do a de-stress activity, but also because I want them to see that, yeah, taking care of the things that are on your plate sometimes is necessary. You need to attack those things in order to be able to have that time to, um, to take for yourself as much as we don't like to admit, sometimes that is it. Um, but again, they can um, relate this to optimal arousal. Um, so I think that it is beneficial to kind of meet them halfway as to where they're at, recognize and respect the demands that they have and the pressures on their life, but find a way to kind of compromise with that. Um, there's a 10 minute progressive relaxation video. I do have other options that I don't specifically do in the classroom just because it can be uh, a little more difficult. Um, you could bring in scents. Technically, if you use essential oils, you would need to get parental permission for that. So please make sure that you are aware of that. Um, I would love to bring pets in, but I know that over the years I've had students who are allergic, um, that sort of thing. So feel free to um, incorporate this, make it your own, do whatever's going to work best for your students. Um, but this was just a way that I felt like not only did right by the curriculum, but also did right by my students. And I felt like that was super important. Um, this tends to be one of um, the activities they feel like was the most beneficial for them uh, because they are, they realize that they're respected as humans and they have to take care of themselves. And, and this is a life skill that they're going to need. All right, moving on to clinical psychology, project I use for my intro to psych class. So this is not something I use at the AP level. Um, most of this is my own creation, but I do wanna give credit to Jeannie Turner who gave me the idea of having students look at case studies of individuals who are successful, even though they have a psychological disorder. A lot of times we're just looking at the negative, we're focusing on the symptoms, we're, we're looking at the things that I mean, really are fascinating, but sometimes we focus on the negative and how it um, can really impact an individual. So within this project, students are investigating a disorder and I do ask for what they're interested in to begin with. So they get to fill out a survey and they take a look at the different categories or groups of individuals uh, or of disorders and they get to rank like on a scale of one to 10, here's how interested I am in this category. And I do assignments based on that because they don't have any understanding really. Um, and it just makes it so much faster if I can say, okay, based on your interest, I'm gonna give you this particular disorder, that sort of thing. So they gotta um, get the definition from the DSM-5. They're looking at the biopsychosocial causes of their particular disorder, the different symptoms that we would see. And while we technically don't assess on treatment in this unit, I still want my students to have exposure to the types of treatment that are out there, whether it's something really interesting or unique or really just to normalize seeking treatment. They get to pick their success story. Um, so that's not something I have a part of. I just have access to the different success stories. And so I'll go down there. So depending on what they're assigned, 
They can pick any of these that are here. Although I do tell them if you know of someone else who has formally been diagnosed, by all means, feel free to do it on that particular person. Um, but I do specify it can't be that the person just says, oh, I have this. They have to say I've been diagnosed because we don't want to take liberties with recognizing symptoms in other people and then just diagnosing them ourselves because that's not appropriate. Um, so they, in their poster or presentation or whatever it is that they make, they highlight, you know, not only the symptoms the individual has that have been communicated according to um, MUDA, so maladaptive, unjustifiable. Uh, I always forget what the D. Dysfunctional. Is. Dysfunctional, thank you. And then atypical. Um, and if the symptoms aren't there, then they can't necessarily reflect on those per se. Um, but I want them to see an example of someone who can flourish in spite of, or sometimes even because of, the psychological disorder that they have. Um, so feel free to use that however you want. I do also have links in here for each one of the um, disorders because I want to specify, please make sure you include this because this really is a... Um, an activity in which like they're teaching their classmates about this. So please make sure you include this. So they have that, uh, please make sure you do not include this. Um, like if for antisocial personality disorder, you cannot talk about that being related to serial killers unless you specify how small of a population that is within individuals who are diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. All right, next, I want to highlight some of the activities that were produced by the APA Summit back in 2017, if I remember correctly. They have three different lesson plans that you can either just incorporate kind of when topics come up because you know we are dealing with motivation and emotion, we are dealing with mental health. Um, even so, you could use these as standalone activities. Um, so I have that gratitude journal in my de-stress lab. You don't have time for de-stress lab. You could still do this particular activity. Um, it's got information on there for, you know, what standards this relates to, about how long this would take, and then walks you through the process of doing this. There's also one on practicing resilience in which students are given a scenario of uh, an some sort of event that would have happened or, or could likely happen to them. And I think it's about somebody not texting you back. Um, okay, so classmate says he will text you about a get together taking place on Friday night. It's late Friday afternoon, but you've not heard from the classmates. You don't actually know why he didn't text you. What are some of the possible reasons why he did not text you? And so students can generate some ideas as to why that individual did not text back. And you can honor the fact that, you know, you're gonna sometimes go right to the negative. You're gonna assume the worst. That's fine. Get those out of the way. But also how can we reframe that? How can we think in a more positive manner? What are some legitimate reasons that are not harmful as to why that individual did not text you back? And so trying to get them to um, use that as a process for how they think about things. Um, instead of automatically just going toward the negative, you know, how can you preserve your mental health and, and just assume the positive in all of that? And then there's also one on character strengths. Um, so this is one in which students would take the character strengths survey. Um, I, I believe they have to put in their email address for this in order to do it. Um, it does not take very long to do. And I actually use this as an activity uh, for my intro students um, in how they introduce themselves to me at the very beginning of the year. So I believe they have 25 different strengths that they're rated on. Um, and so I have them look at the top five strengths that they have, and I have them reflect on each one. Um, so if one of their top strengths is love, you know, just write a quick little sentence on this reflection sheet that I have for them as to um, how you see that absolutely being a strength in your life. And so then as they're working on another activity, that very first or second day, I have them come up to me and introduce themselves. And so I get their name, I get pronouns if they feel comfortable sharing. But then also they tell me like one or two strengths that they have. And I talk to them about why that's of value to them and what or how they see that demonstrated in their life. So I get to know them as 
human beings there as we first interact with each other. Melissa, um, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, yeah, um, I saw something in the chat. No, yeah, some, there's something in the chat um, about how often you see your students and how long you know your class periods are. Okay, I do see my students five days a week and our class periods are 45 minutes. Thank so you. So it's pretty easy for me to do these different positive psych things pretty regularly. Right, consistently. Um, yeah, the other yeah. thing I was gonna say, the VIA survey um, can be something you use all year long. Mm -hmm. um, you have them do it at the beginning. Uh, it also gives you, um, there's a there's a paid version to get like your full report. I don't have kids do that, um, but they'll, they'll get the list. They'll get their top strengths. They also get their areas that need improvement. And I think it's a great way to kind of um, do some goal setting in positive psych and, and have them look at where their areas are that need improvement and maybe come up with like a plan of like how they're going to improve on those things or ideas to brainstorm um, for how to improve on some of those character strengths. Yes, absolutely. All right, I think the only other thing I wanted to make sure to mention is that we have a positive psych unit from APA Tops coming out late fall. Um, and I know that Corey Schwartzrock was part of that. And if you see on the doc that I have here, um, she and Heather Chambers actually did a presentation on having a positive psych unit. Um, so that's really awesome that we are um, getting her to write up something formal for that. There's also a happy documentary if anybody's interested in that and they've got resources to go along with that. And I've used that before as a mini unit. Yeah, 